Mark chapter 12 and verse 28. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognising that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is the one and there is no one else beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbour as himself is much better than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Shall we pray? Father, we do give thanks for your word this morning and uh, a well-known passage of scripture and well-known quoted scriptures by the Lord Jesus to us all. But Lord, we really want a fresh view and a vision of yourself this morning. And not only of yourself, but of our understanding and our appreciation, our devotion and our love for you. Challenge our hearts, challenge our lives, we pray, with your word. May your spirit do a work in each of us this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was um, preparing this message, I buried myself in the text this week and um, and I was going to get up before and let you know that your pastor is meant to be one of those strong guys, okay? But with fresh a view of myself, I understood more and more that I am weak at the best. Weak in the sense that this passage particularly exposed my own selfishness how often I can easily push my own agendas. And, um, but praise God, we don't stay stuck, do we? I repented. And yes, I know I'll probably go down that track because also it was exposed to me how, how very shallow and how very often the flesh rises to the fore when it should be buried. There's been a whole lot of changes, as you all know, uh, that's been um, put on me the, uh, in this last couple of weeks and uh, have implications to the church as well. And, um, wow, I was ashamed how I was even thinking. So your pastor is a weak man. So pray for me that I will be a, a shepherd a one who, who leads by example and a one who has a true love for God, one of the, of the whole heart, the whole mind, the whole soul and strength. Because that's what we all want, eh? And so as I was thinking about this, I was reminded because this passage is about love that of all experiences and human emotions that people want, desire and can get, Love would top the list. You know, no matter what age, people group, or even era you might suggest, a universal longing to love and to be loved is out there. And we can ask the question, why? Simply this, because it's the greatest, the par excellence of all human experience and people will go all out to love and to be loved. Volumes, as you know, of books and songs and media, they speak loudly of this, can I say, this universal link that crosses culture, crosses history and languages. It crosses them all. And so no one can deny this this forever worldwide love consensus. It's really out there. And to this point, God would agree with that too. 
to this point because God is love, right? However, love as the world understands it in its many twisted and distorted shapes and forms is a far cry from God's estimation of what love is. Can I just shift this? I like to sort of see everyone. Not that I'm going to eyeball you and um, Phil, but uh, yeah, it looks like you're trying to hide behind that thing there, <laughs> Phil. And uh, yeah, so um, and so we see love, and it's all its twisted forms that are out there. And um, but it's a far cry, as I said, from God's estimation, and we're going to see that in our text this morning. But before we get there, we need to back up a bit and and remember the setting. I know this has been reiterated over and over again, but I'm taking the cue from Scripture because the Scripture repeats itself, and usually that means emphasis, and so we need to understand it. So I'm going to just go over the background a little bit. Uh, You'll all be familiar. In our passage, it's um, it's Wednesday of Christ's Passion Week, so-called. That is, there's only one whole day by itself this side of Friday when Christ is going to be crucified at Calvary. And here on this Wednesday, Jesus is in the temple. He's experienced amazing stuff already. He's experienced that triumphant entry that we looked back a few weeks ago where he was hailed by the mob as the great deliverer, the hero. And they did all that sort of stuff. You know, they laid palms down and cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, etc. And, and, and all these people hoped that this man who they were giving great accolades to would prove his messiahship by rescuing Israel from its Roman oppressors. That was their hope. Well, all that happened on Monday. Okay? The next day, Tuesday, he went back, but rather than fulfill the hopes of the mob by delivering them with a military attack on the Romans, he attacked all right, but he attacked the very heart of Judaism itself. And how did he do that? We know what he did. He went into the temple with a scourge and he chased out all the money changers and he really hurt some Jewish pride. But he also hurt some Jewish pockets. Why was that? Because, you remember, it was Passover time, right? And it was leading up to that very close. And so Passover time can be likened to our day and age of a pre-Christian, pre-Christmas rush of our common retailer. Okay? So everyone was hanging out for this time in the temple because that's when everyone was buying their sacrifices and doing some money changing. And so business was busy. And so now it was all but bust. Now it's Wednesday. Now it's Wednesday. And so here is Jesus along with his disciples. He's back in, the, in this cleansed temple and teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And of course, the heart of, of the religious leaders really came to the fore here in this section. Yes, their animosity was, was somewhat calmed compared to what it was the day before. Um, it, it had removed itself from its feverish pitch, and, uh, but they still show their true murderous intent. They set out to destroy Jesus. But to do this, they had to be cunning because public opinion was still very much in favour of Jesus. And so they attempt, the only thing they can attempt, and that is to publicly discredit this man, this imposter, they, so, they, so they thought. And so they attempt to make him look bad with Rome and at the same time look bad with his own people. And how they were going to do that is by trapping him with his own words. Now that attempt takes place here in chapters 11 and 12 where they confronted him with a series of questions, right? And we've dealt with those, some of those questions. It was a question in the gar- regarding his, his religious authority over, over the activity in the temple, which he dealt with in a real physical way. It was a question over his political authority of ownership in regards to that poll tax coin that they put before him or he asked to have shown to, the, to him. His theological authority over who's who in the resurrection was certainly questioned and he put them straight on that. And finally here in our text, they ask him one more question. 
One more question to test them with. Actually, if you go to Matthew chapter 22 and 25, uh, 35, you see a parallel of this account and you will see there when it comes to this section that we've read today, asking him a question, testing him. So you know what? Keep that in mind. Their desire was that they would test him and for him to fail the test, right? That was their desire. That was their longing. They tried to test him politically. They tried to test him theologically. And here they have one more shot to bring Jesus down, to bring him down with a spiritual question. This was their last shot. Verse 34 of our reading today tells us that because our text says, and after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. So this was it. This was their last question. So let's have a look at these, this uh, situation here. And I've just divided it up simply for those who want to have jot a few notes. Uh, real, real simple. Um, I've got the last question asked, verse 28. And then we're going to go the last question answered, verse 29 to 31. And then finally, the last question applied, verses 32 to 34. So let's have a look at this last question asked. It seems to be that the scribe, who was also a Pharisee, by the way, scribes were Pharisees, Okay, it seems to be that this scribe, and also if you go to Matthew's account, you'll see he was called the lawyer. So it seems to be that this guy was a cut above the rest, or so he thought. Okay, so he he was he was in, in the upper echelons of the scribes, as it were. He was this lawyer, scribe, this Pharisee. Uh, he comes to Jesus after he had responded to these uh, people who were questioning about the the Sadducees about the resurrection, and he responded that you have answered well and that word well that we see we see here in verse um, 28 has the idea of being beautiful being complete and so what Jesus had done here to these Sadducees he had left them can we say with no room to move he totally shut them down now that I would suggest would impress any lawyer even today, right? And how true it was that we know that never man spake like this man. What authority he had. Well, it was such was his answer that this scribe had a question all of his own to put to Jesus. Now we may note as we read through this and we pick up the, the, the ethos and the, um, as we read these words, we may, we may note that the, there was an innocence of this man's approach. And also we can pick it up also in the gentle response that Jesus gave to the scribe where he says in verse 34 back to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. There wasn't a, there was a, wasn't a, lack, there was a lack of rebuke. There was, there was a niceness about this. There was gentleness about this. And we certainly can see some, some personal interaction that was going on between Jesus and the scribe, and the scribe and Jesus. But it seems that when we read both Matthew and Mark's account together, this man may well have approached Jesus with a foot in two camps. You know what I mean? One in the Pharisee's camp, which was out to destroy Jesus, because don't forget, he was a Pharisee, the scribe, and the other coming from this man personally from an inquiring perspective. And so as we think about this, it may seem that this man's reason for questioning Jesus was innocent and free from any malicious intent and was somewhat independent from the, from the overall thrust of these questions that have been foisted on Jesus thus far. It may come across that like that. But as we look at this overall context of this section, I believe it tells us otherwise. What is on display here in this overall section of this questioning section of these four questions that are foisted on Jesus in chapter 11 and 12 is basically the way and the reason for the approach of all these people, of this, these religious Jews. The way of approach and the reason for their approach. We know that they were bent on destroying him. We see that right back in chapter 3 verse 6 and it really comes to the 4 and verse 13 of this chapter. And, and this scribe, those seeming to approach Jesus innocently, I believe he was not squeaky clean according to the thrust of the overall context. Okay, So there was certainly a foot in both camps and he certainly wasn't uh, that innocent inquiring, uh, please let me know Lord Jesus sort of style. So what question does he ask? 
He asks this question. He wants to know which is the first commandment of all. In other words, which is the biggie? Which is the first one? Which is the most important? Now, this was a common area of discussion, you know, between religious Jews of the day. A common area, area of discussion. But before we, what we, and so what we need to understand is why was that? What was behind this question? What was going down? What was the thinking of the people uh, that he would ask this question? Well, when you think about the answer that Jesus gave, you have to think about who wrote that answer. It was Moses, right? And who was Moses to the people of Israel, even in Jesus' day? He was, believe me, the hero of heroes. Okay? After all, Moses was the man. And he was their man. Anyone who could speak face to face with God has got to be set apart and was certainly a friend of the Jews. And so they also knew Moses as God's man. After all, to whom, what man could be entrusted the whole law of God to be given to the world? It was Moses. And here was also Moses the man who was given the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. So Moses was their great hero and to many even in that era and after, Moses was above angels. He was it. He was the greatest hero in their scheme of things. And and anyone who messed with Moses messed with Yahweh and if you messed with Yahweh and messed with Moses, you messed with Judaism. And so here is what is important to understand. The Jews believed that here was this Jesus man coming along and he was in opposition to the teaching of Moses. He was messing with their hero, or was about to. And they really believed that. That is why Jesus, he understood all that of course, that is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he was very careful to make clear to all those who were listening primarily to his disciples, but all the crowd that were listening to him there that day. And he says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, the law of who? The law that Moses was entrusted to. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew five seventeen. He was very careful to announce that. In other words, Jesus understood that his authority evidenced over the last period that he'd been on earth, on this months, the years before, just about up to three years, he he knew that his authority evidenced over the natural world. And it was, and we've read some of that, right? Calm the sea. His authority evidenced over the spiritual world, casting out demons. His authority evidenced even by raising the dead. He knew even that his authority was going to be seen as a challenge to the Jewish system and to the Jewish faith. And to Moses. He knew that. And so sure enough, the religious religious leaders could only see that Jesus as one who would be attacking their religious roots and even Moses himself. He knew that Judaism would would see him as, as one who was trying to diminish and make less of the law of Moses and more of himself. They could see him as one who would be trying to elevate himself above Moses. And that's why Jesus said again on another occasion, I have not come even to remove one, in the old King James Version, jot or chisel of the word. He was so clear on that because he knew what they were thinking and how they were thinking. And so they believed otherwise and they believed that he was going to diminish Moses. So their plan through the scribe's seemingly innocent question was to get Jesus to say that he supersedes Moses' authority. You know, if they can trap him in this, you know what? If they can trap him in this, they they then can rightly accuse him of blasphemy. And in doing that, he will discredit himself. That would mean he would be unpopular with the people who revered Moses as the in all end all. A very cunning plan. Hence, there's all this important question concerning this divinely given law that Moses received. What? commandment is the foremost of all. Now you need to understand also that 
that Jewish scribes and rabbis had identified 613 commands in the law. That's in the whole Pentateuch. The first five books of Moses, they'd gone through it scrupulously like they did. They would have known it all off by heart like all those guys did their day. day. And, and that identified 613 separate laws. Okay? And um, that's... And with their, their letterism gymnastics, on top of that, with their letterism gymnastics, they had found out or they discovered or they, or they made happen in themselves that, um, that each of those laws coincided with the this, this letters in the Ten Commandments. 613 letters in the Ten Commandments, that's in the Hebrew script. Um, there were 613. And so that made it all kosher for them and so th- that's, what they, th- that's what they followed. But they had a problem. They had a problem here. What do you do with 613 laws from God? Well, give us a break. You can't keep 613 laws, can you? No one can. That's just too many. So what we'll do is we'll divide them up into laws that are heavy and laws that are light. And this is what they did. And this is what they still do. They divide them up into heavy and light laws. The heavy being... Absolutely binding, you must keep. The light being optional, uh, if you break them, it's not too bad, you know. So that's what they did in their endeavours to fulfil and try and meet the standard that God has set. And so here were these scribes, and another thing was that they, the scribes, they loved to debate the prioritising. Okay, which was light, which was heavy, which was foremost, which was etc, etc. This is their whole life was spent on, on debating and working out this stuff. And, uh, there was, and they constantly um, were trying to figure out that, which one deserved more attention than the other. And so this is the background to their approach. And to them, here is Jesus, this person with this, with this huge ego who is trying to establish himself as Messiah. If he is false, as we think he is, he's going to say something that supersedes Moses. He's going to set himself up as an authority. He's going to give some new law that is certainly not orthodox. It's going to be something new that cannot be right and then we have the right to charge him with heresy before the people. That's the idea. So Jesus, the master, the teacher, he gives, they ask, give us the number one commandment. Spell it out for it. That's their, that's their question, his question. This is where we come to number two, the last question answered. We see this in verses 29 to 31. What does Jesus say? Well, we see that there's absolutely no pause, no hesitation on Jesus' part at all. He said in response, The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. We have that in verses 29 and 30. What an answer. What an answer. You know where he got that? He got that from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It is known as the, in Hebrew, as the Shema. Well, Shema means here, right? And um, this is something that every good Jew said over and over again, every night and every morning. Jesus gave an answer that was exactly opposite to what they wanted him to give. They wanted him to supersede Moses as an answer, not agree with him, for goodness sake. And here he does, he recites the most familiar words that Moses ever wrote. As a matter of fact, these words were so familiar and so precious and so much in their minds that they physically and literally put little boxes on their heads and and they put them and in that boxes they had strips of paper and um, and they tied them around their heads and around their forearms and, and they even put these little boxes on the doors in their homes, insides and outsides. Okay, and the reason for this was that they were trying to fulfill the same chapter in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8 and 9, where the Lord said this, You shall bind them on the, as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on your, on the, as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You see, this was the Shema that was all over the place, folks, what Jesus quoted here. And so by quoting Moses, what Jesus did is he hit them right at the very core of their own religion. He is saying, by saying what he did, I'm no apostate, I'm no heretic, this is not new doctrine. 
And what he does is he affirms his absolute solidarity with what Moses had said. He speaks to them of scripture that is most familiar to all of them. So what does this answer that Jesus gave really mean? What does it mean? We note in our text in verses 30 and 31, it contains one main verb that everything else hangs on. It's the verb love. And love is a verb, right? This verb needs to be understood as the divine author intended it to be understood, uh, by the way, and not as our culture dictates it and has misconstrued it to mean with all its attachments, etc. It refers primarily to the love of the will, to the love of the mind. It's, it's a love of action rather than a love of feeling or a love of emotion. This is the word agape. It is, it is, the, it is the highest kind of love. Not the love you just feel, but the love of, of dedication, the love of commitment, the love that says this is right and this is good no matter what I feel. This love is different than another kind of love that, that was even in biblical times and also in our time. This love is different than the filio type of love which is all about emotions and affection and there's nothing wrong with emotion and affection. God gave us that, right? But if we're just driven by emotion and affection, we're going to land ourselves in a whole lot of hot water, folks. There's too much of that around, even in religious circles. Emotion and affection. Nothing wrong with it, but by itself, it can be dangerous. This agape love is also higher than and greater than another kind of love which was in biblical days and also in our day. We don't look at love like this. It's called in the Greek eros. It's an eros kind of love. That's a love that is sensual. It's, it's physical attraction. Nothing wrong with that either. God gave it to us, right? Praise God that we're attracted towards other people. Primarily, if you want to look at the example, um, man and woman, woman to man. God gave us that. But if we're just driven by that eros kind of love... Very dangerous. We see too much right out in our world today too, don't we? So this agape love, this highest kind of love, it's an intelligent love whereby it results in a love that is all about purposeful commitment. Purposeful commitment. And so Jesus says here, the number one thing is to love God with this kind of love. With everything that you are. Love God with these, with these four channels of human faculty that you have with, the, with all the heart, with all the mind, with all the soul, with all your strength, working separately but in unison to love God perfectly. Please note that the heart, soul, the mind and strength are not just pushed together to describe the, the holistic makeup of, it, of any human being. Okay, it's not just Jesus, God, it wasn't just God here just saying, well, you have to love God with, with all you are. No, no, and so he just adds a bit. No, no, it's not that. If that was the case, Jesus would have said exactly this. You love your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That's what he would have said. But he doesn't say that. He separates these four faculty functions purposely and this is what he says. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. You see that? He pushes these functions apart to describe the comprehensive love that God demands of our entire beings from every facet of our makeup and all working together in perfect unison for that one purposeful commitment. For example, we all know what it is, and maybe some of you are in it right now, to be involved in your job, but your heart's not in it. It's the same as people who go all out in their endeavours to please God with their religious ceremonies and their sacrificial good works. Their strength may be involved, but their heart and soul are disengaged. Also, many people are satisfied with their level of devotion to God and that they believe in Him. Their minds are engaged. But that's where it stops. And they may be even convinced that everything is kosher and good with their mind being engaged. 
But not, God is not satisfied just with good works or a mere intellectual belief. Even the devils tremble and believe, right? James 2.19 tells us that. They believe and they tremble. Why the, why, so why are the devils not redeemed? They believe in God. You see, though they believe in God, they do not love God. They do not love God. Agape love God. But you may ask, well, can I just love God the way I want? And sort of work up to it and sort of get there on my own strength. Can I just choose to start loving God the agape way? No, you cannot. No, you cannot. And this is important because the Bible tells us that every single one of us, we are born sinners, we're all enemies of God. And this, though this may sound harsh and you may not know it, but you will know it now, you are haters of God who are outside of Christ. You're against God. You read Romans chapter 1 verse 30 and Romans chapter 5 verse 10 and that'll tell you very clearly. Don't take my word for it. To love God as we should necessitates that first of all we be forgiven by God, by God right? We must be forgiven by God. What for? Forgiven for not loving God. We who are outside of Christ, we who are sinners by nature and practice, who are not born again, who are not saved, who are not redeemed, are God's enemies. We are against God. That's what we are by nature. We cannot help it because of Adam's sin. We do not love God. We cannot love God in that state. And so we need to be forgiven. And that forgiveness forgives us for not loving God. Okay, that's the first step. We need a saviour to pay the penalty for our sin of not loving God. And that's where all other sins stem from, whether it's selfishness, whether it's lust, or whether it's greed or whatever you like. All the other sins stem from being in this position of not loving God. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, he bore the penalty for our sin. For that what? For that primary sin of not loving God, which also results in sins plural, which we know heaps about. So salvation and redemption comes in. But there's a thick second thought on this. Second thought on this. God not only forgives us for our past lack of love, but you know what else he does here? The moment we trust in Christ, the moment we call upon him for mercy and, and look to him for our salvation, you know what he does? He infuses in us the ability in the present and the future to love God rightly. Where do you get that? I get that from Romans 5 where it says the love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's when it happens when we're saved. So we have the potential, we have the ability by the Holy Spirit to love God agape. It's not something that you can conjure up and work up yourself, folks. You see, salvation is all of the Lord and even to love God in the right way, you just cannot do it yourself. It's a gift from God. The Spirit of God, when given to us in salvation, enables us to love God. And that is the only way the love of God can be accomplished as described in our text. Right love for God is of divine origin. It doesn't start with us. It doesn't start with you. And that's a distinguishing mark, by the way, of any truly redeemed person. They love God with this kind of love. The distinguishing mark of any person who is truly redeemed will love God with this kind of love, agape love. We need to understand that. You see, no one is ever right with God no matter what kind of activity you're engaged in. No one is ever right with God no matter how regular you attend church or how many good things you do or how many rules you keep. No one is ever right with God until their heart and soul and mind and strength manifest the love for God. And that ability to do that is given to us by God when we call out to him for mercy and salvation and forgiveness. You know, that's why we preach that intellectual belief alone does not make a person become a Christian. A person becomes a Christian when they demonstrate by faith and obedience a consuming love of God, a love for God, a love that engages the heart, the soul, the mind and one's strength. 
We're not just talking about the rah, rah, rah here, which is all about emotion. We all know something about that. We're emotional beings. God has made us that way. But God wants to engage more than that, folks. He wants to engage the heart with a, with a seat of affection, the emotion with a feeling, and he wants to engage also the, the very mind, the, the believing and the trust and the strength. That's where the good works come and, and doing what we do for God. It is the idea of total commitment and total surrender. That's what it's all about, total commitment and total surrender. This is the kind of love that God gives to us through Jesus You know, God loves us that way. He loves us that way. And he demonstrated that, his love that way by sending his son. And so hence we can say now that we love God. Why? Because he first loved us. This kind of love God gives, it demands the same agape love from his people. It's an intelligent love, it's a feeling love, it's a willing love, and it's a serving love. In verse 31, we see Jesus here then goes on and he, and he pushes his answer a little further than the scribe asked for. A bit like some preachers, maybe myself, you get a little bit more than you asked for. He says this, the second is this, you shall have a neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. See that? See what the Lord does is he builds, he builds onto the first commandment and uh, loving the Lord like we should is the primary commandment of the law. law and, and if you have that one in place, we'll have no problem with the rest. That's what it's basically saying. The same love for God will also flow toward others. In other words, when you love God right, you will love people right. If you find yourself not loving people right, you can guarantee for sure it's because you don't love God right. That's the idea behind that the, that the Pharisees didn't like here. Why? Because they didn't love people right. They bound them with heavy burdens. They used and abused people. They treated people as a means to their own ends and for their own gains. That's how often it is even in our world, right? Because people do not love God. They are naturally lovers of self. And that is clearly seen in their lack of love for their fellow man. Now this should certainly not be so among believers, right? Our response is to be love God and to love men. You know, Christianity, I just love the simplicity of Christianity. Being a Christian is it's so simple, but we make it so complicated. It's so simple because it's all about love and obedience, love and obedience. It's like a horse and carriage to go together. It's like love and marriage. Sorry, the horse and carriage, love and marriage, the rhyme there. I'm getting clever as I get older. It's so simple. And this is the true essence, the very essence of being a true follower of Jesus. Love God and love men. And if you love God, you will obey his commandments by loving your neighbor as yourself. What a challenging question that is. What a challenging statement and a truth that is. To all of us, it has been to me and it is to me. Our neighbors, our friends, our work contacts. People within even his own community. Are we loving one another firstly here as we should? See, if you get that right, everything else will fall into place. I love for God. And this begs the question as we sort of kind of wrap it up here. The question we face is that what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue as we are? And are we going to come be, or are we going to come before the Lord and seek his help to love like we are commanded to love? And that brings us to right to the last question or the, how the question is applied here by Jesus in verses 32 and verse 34. This is when the scribe hears the, the Lord's answer to his response. He hears him say, right, well, the same word you were used, by the way, in verse 28. This word means beautiful, it means complete. And so he is saying, yes, he says to Jesus, that, that is a beautiful answer, um, that a complete answer. There is one God and, and to love him perfectly and to love others perfectly is far more important than all the religious rituals in the world. 
What a great statement. This man had it all down. He, he was absolutely right in his understanding. Wow, wouldn't you love people in your church like that? This man had come to understand that a truth that eludes most people. Many, many people. This, this scribe had grasped the truth that, that religion and rituals will never be enough to save the soul. That's what he understood. He understood that relationship is far more important than religion. Relationship with God. He knew that he could keep all the law and offer all the sacrifices and still not be right with God. He knew that. And most folks never understand that truth, folks. All over the world, people will go to church, they'll go through their rituals and think they're in a saving relationship with God and in truth, they are lost and on their way to hell. How sad is that? Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 tells us that it's by God's grace alone through faith alone that a person is saved. And so to be able to love God as we ought begins with a work of God's grace where he convicts us and regenerates our dead hearts to come alive and respond in faith and obedience to his great love. Where we begin loving God. But look at Jesus. He has the last say here in verse 34. I love when Jesus has the last say. He will do, you know, by, one by, by the way. It doesn't seem so much like in our world, but he will do. And he has the last say to this man. He, he understands where this man is coming from. He knows that here is a man who can think for himself. He had the nous up here. He knows that here is a man who believes in God and how love for God is linked with relationship to others. He, he knows all that right stuff. Then Jesus looks at this man and says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, you are close, but you're not quite there. What does Jesus mean by that? He means simply this, that this man was close, but he was still at a distance. Still at a distance. A bit like the French and the All Blacks. Well, they were close, but they still lost. Right? So whether it was 20 to nil, they still lost. Well, this man was still lost, even though he was so close. I had to get that in, Steve. He knew everything, but what was missing, folks, there was no heart and no soul. There was no faith in the truth here. There was no, and because of that, there was no agape love, which is heart and soul stuff, right? This is where faith and trust and commitment are engaged, folks. And he didn't have that. He didn't have it. Folks, here is what we need to know this morning. I urge you to ponder these things. It is possible for a person to have a religious upbringing and still be lost. It is possible to know the truth and still be lost. It's possible to have heard the gospel over and over again in your lifetime and, and be resting on someone else's goodness or what you do and what you don't do. It is possible to be within an inch of heaven and still die and then go to hell. It is possible. I cannot impress upon you enough that knowing God about God and spiritual things is not enough. You need to know intimately God's love through Jesus Christ alone so then that you can love God and love others as you ought with a heart of love that comes from God. Ask ourselves, do we love in that way? My desire is that we all might know what it is and to love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love others as yourself. What a great thing we can go if we're charged with that this next week, challenged with that and charged with that. And, and even as believers in the sanctifying process, you know, we can't say that we do this perfectly, but undergirding our whole lives, there is a bent that we want to love God, right? this way. Let us be encouraged with that. It is possible. Why? Because God has shared abroad His love in our hearts. So don't think, oh, I can't do it because I'm me. We can move further and further and pass towards the goal of Jesus Christ. 
Shall we pray? Father, we do give thanks as we have looked at your word this morning. What can we say? Lord, help us to love you as we ought. Challenge us. May none of us leave this place unless and until we have really dealt personally with our own station in life in regards to a relationship with you. So, Father, help us in this. Help us to get right with you. Lord, we would long to see your love manifested in our lives from that true perspective. Help us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name.